Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series, made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Hello everyone, I am Michaela Hall, Assistant Director of the Library. I want to thank you all for attending the program today and also thank all of those that put in lots of hard work to make this happen. The Library's Program Committee, especially Susan Martin, who's Chair of the Committee, and of course Ray. I also have to express my deep gratitude to Susan, who is retiring from the Library Board and her role as Chair of the Program Committee after seven years. Thank you for all that you have done for the Library, Susan, truly, truly. All participants, please keep your video off and your mics muted unless asked by myself or Ray to turn them on. This will ensure there's no sound interference or lag during Ray's presentation. If participants have any questions throughout the meeting, please type them in the chat, which library staff member Ivy Burns will be monitoring. All questions will be answered when Ray is ready to open up Q&A. I am recording the program. All personal information, such as names of participants, will be edited out before it is uploaded to our YouTube channel for viewing by those who couldn't attend today. Thank you again, everyone. And I now turn it over to Dodie Bump, who's a member of the Library's Program Committee. Take it over, Dodie. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you all again for joining us this evening. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce this evening's speaker, Ray Uzanis. Ray is a writer, photographer, and global adventurer who continues to travel the world in search of interesting and scenic regions of the world, rich in wildlife and cultural diversity. In fact, I believe he's leaving on a trip shortly. And he lives right here in Stonington, and he's taken some amazing pictures of, of the area right around here. So he's a wonderful photographer. In this presentation, Ray will share his 2018 visit to the African country of Namibia, which he has called Africa's coastal treasure. In fact, it, we discovered tonight that he was there almost exactly two years ago. Whether with his published books or lectures, Ray best summarizes his intent simply, quote, I hope my photographs and writings reasonably capture the best of nature's artistry as well as its inhabitants and will be of interest and value to others, unquote. So take it away, Ray, and thank you again for joining us. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I can see uh, Matt and Kitty uh, joined us. They're actually watching this from their home in England, perhaps getting to bed later than they normally would. Uh, I just heard about Susan retiring. I hope the heck it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that she got stuck with me as a speaker and she's heading for the hills, but I hope that's not the case. Uh, in any event, uh, it, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, those of you that have signed in accompanying me on this, oh, it should be a 45 minute journey through one of Africa's lesser known countries. Uh, yet it's one that is a treasure chest of, of mineral wealth, unparalleled desert beauty, as you'll see shortly, and incredible, uh, incredibly adapted wildlife. Now, Namibia has on rare occasion been mistakenly called Nambia. It is not Nambia, it is Namibia. Uh, here it is on the, on a map, and you can see it down in the southwest corner of the continent. In fact, it was actually called Southwest Africa until it gained its independence in uh, 1990. Now, uh, before we begin our journey, uh, let me just take no more than a minute or two. I want to just give you a brief overview of the country and, and actually where we'll be going on our trip here. Uh, the, the uh, capital city you can see is here. Uh, why is it my thing working? Oh, sorry about that. Oh, here we go. Oh, I didn't want to go there yet. <laughs> Here's the capital city. Uh, briefly, just some facts and figures. Uh, uh, Namibia is, is about twice the size of uh, California, but with uh, only two and a half million people, 
after Mongolia, it is the uh, country with the lowest population density. The capital city is Windhoek, which has about maybe 10% of the uh, population, you know, about a quarter of a million. And uh, in terms of the economy, uh, mining continues to be the most important driver of Namibia's economy. They mine, excuse me, they mine everything from diamonds to uranium. As a matter of fact, I probably last year, the last couple of years, it has emerged as the, uh, the, the largest exporter of uranium. Uh, tourism has now taken off in a, in a way that's bringing it to its own in an important part of the economy. The, uh, the official language actually of Namibia is English, although only I think 3% of, uh, of the homes actually speak it. And the most common language would be, uh, if I'm pronouncing correctly, uh, Ashiwambo, which is spoken by about half the population. Uh, there are other, there are several others, uh, too numerous for me to mention here. Uh, uh, African is one that's used uh, for a lot of public communication. The uh, white community, which is only numbers less than 10% of the, of the population, will speak that or German going back to its, you know, to its earlier roots there. Uh, there are several indigenous ethnic groups. Uh, we'll be seeing one of them later on, uh, Herreras, Himbas, uh, among others. Now, in Namibia itself, what we're going to be doing, we're, we'll be starting here in Windhoek and then heading down south and really following it from, from the south all the way up this way along the, the various coastal areas, the Skeleton Coast, and end up in uh, Utasha, which is their premier uh, game national park. Namibia itself uh, is the driest of the uh, sub Saharan African countries. Uh, it's uh, claimed to be the oldest desert in the world as well as having the, uh, the, highest, uh, the highest sand dunes. So uh, without further ado, why don't we uh, jump in the vehicle and uh, let's head out and see what we've got. Uh, this is the, I could say rather nondescript capital of uh, Namibia, Windhoek. And I'm only gonna show a couple of uh, slides here. And this first one, uh, this represent, this is a, uh, called the Christus Kirch, K-I-R-C-H, Christus Church. It's, it's the most famous of the buildings in Windhoek, and it, it's kind of got, got a fairy tale nickname to it, you can see by, by the architecture. And it's a Lutheran church. It was built, uh, I think, about 1999, 1910, and it was intended to commemorate the peace between the Germans and the indigenous Herreros uh, people. It houses several plaques inside honoring the dead Germans, but nothing, and I'm aware of nothing of the uh, indigenous population that they did their best to exterminate. We'll have a little story about that later on. Now this shot here was taken. Was taken from, from this building. Now this here, this is the Independence Memorial Museum. And this is relatively new, very new, actually built in 2014. And the, uh, the uh, statue in front of it is uh, Sam Nujoma. He's, he's like the George Washington of, uh, of Namibia. And he served as their first president from 1990, to, I think 2005. Now, what's interesting about this building is it was designed, built by a North Korean company. Now, if you remember just a minute or two ago, I, I mentioned how uh, Namibia has become probably the world's largest exporter of uranium. And we all here know what's going on in North Korea with their nuclear armament program. So I don't know, was this a quid pro pro? Uh, don't know. But anyway, I thought that was rather interesting. Okay, let's let's get out of Dodge City here and let's get into the country. Uh, now we are not traveling in the country by mule and cart here, but we are going in the gas-powered vehicles. And what we're doing, we're heading out, and the first place we're going to be is a uh, what they call the quiver tree forest. And these are trees. These are actually 
a species of aloe, the aloe plant. And they occur throughout the southern part. These are, these are the hottest, driest parts of, of Namibia. And they're so named for the, uh, the quiver. Quivers would be the, like the cases for the arrows that were used by the Bushmen. And the, uh, the branching system from these trees is, is, is relatively hollow. So they served uh, a good purpose for that, hence, you know, hence the name. Uh, here's another, now this picture, you're starting to see uh, a huge nest. And you're gonna see that in some of the subsequent photos too. These, these nests are actually uh, built by weavers. These are uh, uh, social weavers. And they can be large, they can be rather large. Uh, here's a close up and you're gonna see, you see several, several of the nesting holes. Uh, the interesting thing is they're not all they're not all occupied. In fact, some of them are actually dummy ones that are put in uh, to uh, to fool. They're, one of their main predators is uh, cobra snakes. So uh, just to minimize the chance of the cobra getting one of them live, they often send them to, uh, end up in, a, in an empty empty nest. The uh, also want to point out because of the, the climate there, the dryness, the, the tree itself, the uh, the outer bark and the branching uh, do contain a, a, a waxing coating just to minimize the uh, trans, uh, transpiration of the water out. Now, every so often, every so often, you'll see a, a, a parakeet come by and whether it's there to occupy a nest on a longer term basis or just an overnight or just a brief, I don't know, but it's quite common to, to see that. And here's just a lasting uh, image. This was, uh, you know, just light painted with a flashlight in a, in a dark sky. Just, I think it basically just characteristically best describes, uh, best shows what these trees are all about. Uh, the scene here, I'm gonna just a couple minutes on this. These are, these are desert horses. Uh, they actually dwell in the desert there on their own. And the uh, numbers can vary. Uh, anywhere from under 100 to as much as 300, depending strictly on the on the rainfall amounts. And uh, the origins are debated. In fact, there's so many theories, I'm not going to waste uh, our time trying to figure out which which one it was. Just suffice to say that they live there. Uh, they obviously have remarkable survival skills. We're seeing we're seeing the uh, plains there in July, and you can see a little bit of, of green in the background. But you know, you look at it, in, in, uh, and in the spring, of course, it's it's rather lush with grass, so it looks rather idyllic for them. But come the fall and winter time, it's nothing but gravel plains, and their survival is very much at stake. Uh, some of the the uh, local indigenous people, uh, there's a couple of areas there I saw where they put like a, a trough with water, because most of the water in, in Namibia is basically based on ground groundwater. So, uh, but it's a way to uh, at least minimize their, their, you know, their losses uh, from, uh, from not having enough water. Okay, now we're going to move on. And we're looking, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here, number one, because it's, I think, very interesting. And it's very different than any of the other uh, such mining operations you see worldwide. This actually is an abandoned mine. This, this, uh, this town served the purpose up until... Oh, the early 1960s. But before we, before I talk more about it, tell you what it is, let's just look at a, just going to go through a few photos. Remember, this, this was an active town, uh, had maybe three, four hundred uh, people that, uh, uh, that worked and lived there and all the amenities that went with that town until uh, they did it. So let's, uh, let's just look, let's see what 50 years of, uh, of sitting there does for the town. I'm just gonna, these be without comment. I'll just leave them on there for a bit so you get a sense of the, uh, how quickly and thoroughly the sand dunes uh, can take over the area. Don't forget, very high winds all along those coasts. So certainly it's, it's helped along by that. These would be living quarters, working, you know, different parts of the town. You can see it's a, relatively speaking, a popular tourist destination just by looking at all the footprints uh, 
uh, there's only a few, just a few of us, so uh, we do get they do get a lot of people there. This would have been the headquarters of the, the mining management, living quarters, operating offices, and so forth. And uh, we're approaching sunset hour. That's actually the moon rising. And uh, this is a kind of an overview of the town. So, okay, we've seen what, what's there now. Uh, what was there before that prompted them to build what they have? Well, the answer is one word, simple. Diamonds. I'm gonna take a, a few minutes now to talk because there's a very unusual aspect to the, the diamonds there and how they were, we use the term mine, which is in a sense a misnomer. But let me just, uh, just for a few moments, uh, I give you a brief overview of, of diamond. Most of the diamond that's mined, whether it's in interior Africa, Australia, Siberia, Canada, you name it, you know, they're mined at the site where the, you know, the diamonds come to the surface to extinct the volcanic pipes uh, over eons of time. And those places would become mines that are you know, basically open pit mines. You go in with big equipment, you chop out, the, uh, chop out the, the bedrock, all the material goes along, you take it off and you process it. And when you do, you'll get, diamonds such as these. This is just an example of a, of a uh, representative collection of diamonds. If you look at them, uh, you look at them, most of these are what we call industrial grade. Diamonds like this aren't going to find their way into anybody's ring or brooches or what have you. Uh, some like this, here you go, these here, these could be what they call cuttables of gem quality. But the, um, but the and here's another view of it for, for just for uh, scale. Uh, so that's what you're getting. Now, the difference is, come back and let's come back to the difference is that the diamonds that are found in Namibia are what they what we call alluvial diamonds. In other words, these are diamonds that have been transported from its source, the interior, you know, Zaire, you name whatever it was, the interior source where the where they originated. They've been transported mostly, you know, by rivers, uh, Orange River in this case is the, the main one, but by being transported, you know, maybe a thousand miles or more, uh, what survives it? Certainly not those, not these, the, not these diamonds here that are heavily, you know, fractured, flawed, what have you. Uh, but you're going to get the diamonds that are going to end up there are going to be typically of what you're seeing here, uh, high quality, they're gem, gem quality material, so that. The, uh, the diamonds that are being found along the Namibian coast are you know, 95% uh, uh, gem quality. Now, the interesting thing is, so, okay, uh, how did that come about? Well, you know, back in, right around the turn of the century, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 1905, thereabouts, uh, it's, it's been historically noted that you could, one could go down on the beaches there, and especially on a moonlit night, look on the beach and, you know, you see some glitter, you go down there and wow, you've, uh, you find yourself a diamond. And it literally was that easy at that point. So much so that uh, there was a gentleman working uh, out of a London jeweler's office who uh, made a trip down there to investigate what was going on. And during the course of his subsequent visits, a gentleman by the name of Ernest Oppenheimer started buying up by hook and crook much of the area along there. There's a long story that I'm not going to waste our time on that, but suffice to say that over the course of a few years, uh, he started buying up, it got closed off, it became known as, even to this day, the Forbidden Zone. And he consolidated the, uh, uh, the land into an area called, and ended up calling Consolidated Diamond Mines. Uh, you might not recognize that name, but there, there was a precursor to a name that you maybe would, De Beers. So from that point on, uh, what you had was uh, you had these diamonds in the sand. Now keep in mind, how do you mine the diamonds? Well, you really, you know, those of you might have had a Tonka truck when you were little, 
went down to the beach, play around with it, dig up the sand, move it around and so forth. Very, very different than what was being done here, obviously with, with uh, equipment a thousand times bigger and instead of just sand, there were diamonds. But it actually was that easy, it was that easy to get the diamonds. Consequently, consequently, you have, now this, I'll let you read this uh, while I'm talking, but there's a small museum in this, the name of the town incidentally is Coleman Stop, Coleman Scott, K-O-L-M-A-N, S-K-O-P. And I'm not going to go with the, but obviously because the diamonds were so easily uh, located, you know, smuggling, stealing them by workers or what have you was, was, uh, was a concern. And uh, I'm not going to talk because basically uh, any, uh, any way that, that they could be uh, taken out has been tried. The one that <laughs> sticks with me, though, for both originality and maybe stupidity is the use of carrier pigeons. Uh, a, a worker, of course, he would have his cohort on the outside. He would have a, a, a carrier pigeon. He would attach one way or another uh, a parcel of diamonds to the wing or the legs or whatever it is and send them off on his way. The only problem with that is <laughs> the, uh, the pigeon would get started. I don't know how far he would go, but oftentimes he really couldn't go that far because the weight was too much and he'd turn around and head back to his owner. And of course, who was waiting there was, was the management. So that didn't work out. But to show how much of a concern given the nature of the findings were to the, to the management group, uh, the reward to those that would, would you know, uh, tell, uh, advise, you know, to let them know who was doing it, you know, whatever, would be one third of the retail value of the stones that were attempted to be smuggled out. So it, it paid to be a snitch, I guess, if that's the proper word for it. Uh, anyhow, okay, so, uh, everything has to come to an end. Why? It, it ended in 1960-ish uh, and so forth. So what happens after that? Well, this next scene here, this is the town of Luderitz. L-U-D-E-R-I-T-S. Luderitz. Well, what's going on there? There's no beach. Well, but there is an ocean. Okay. And what this is, you know, because the diamonds as we described, as I described earlier, ended up on the beach. Nothing has to say they stop at the beach. Obviously, over time, some are going to end up in the in the seabed, in the uh, offshore areas. And right now, today, that's where the diamonds are being mined. And it's being done a couple of ways. What you're seeing here is a ship, and this, you know, for lack of a more technical term, large industrial scale vacuum cleaners. They go down and scoop up the you know the material down below and, and process it. Uh, there's another way it's being done now, and I obviously didn't see it, but to me, this is, this is fascinating. Uh, there are areas along there in the ocean, off Luteritz, where going out is, it could be as much as a half a mile. Uh, they are creating, they meaning uh, the companies, there's two companies operating, one, and it's uh, uh, Namibia and the Beers Group form, are, you know, they have a, a commercial uh, operation there. And what they do, is they have created artificial dams with the sand so that they have actually they'll dam up uh, sections of the of the ocean inshore get rid of the water and then go down go down with equipment and scoop it now the sand in this case i don't want to get too technical on it but the sand that they use for the dams is not where the diamond in this case in the ocean the diamonds are not in the sand uh, diamonds are heavy. They have a higher specific gravity than the sand. So they're going to end up below the sand into the, uh, you know, the gra there's a second layer of gravel there. So the sand is used to build these walls. And for a period of time, they go in with equipment in this, this uh, now dried out part of the ocean and pull out the diamonds. I, I, that to me blows my mind. And there's a third way. Uh, there's a third way. Uh, oh, yeah, a third way. And it's called diamond divers. Now, this is obviously not on a commercial scale, but if you have a boat and the inclination, you can get a, a, a license, get a license from uh, NAMDEB, and it will give you a lot, you a certain section of the seafloor, of the ocean, really, because you got your diet, you're in the water, and you can go down and dive for diamonds. 
Now, obviously, it's treacherous. Uh, certainly, uh, the uh, the danger to your own personal self is significant. But you know, there has been there's been enough of a reward for those that are doing it that they will continue to do it. And you know, you're talking about uh, the people living on you know subsistence living, really. So here's a chance for them to. To uh, you know, to make some some decent money out of those things. So that's it's that's not an unusual thing to do. I don't know more about it myself, but I do know it's being done. Okay, that's that's enough about diamonds. Let's get out of here and let's go look at some more attractive areas of the country. Okay, we're now we're heading out. Uh, we are heading out to uh, the uh, the desert, the classical desert area, and you can start to see the uh, the reddish sands of the area uh, obviously it's why it's the wildlife is there i just took up uh, this picture just because i like the pose there i don't know but we're entering the an area called the um if i'm pronouncing this correctly sashi blade sashi blade it's the large namib desert and this is uh this is what we're going to be looking this is what we're going to be looking at for a while i'm talking about you know, it's got the uh, the oranges, the apricot, the pink colors that you're seeing, uh, which give it its, its characteristic beauty, due in, in some measure anyway to the fact that, you know, there's an iron, iron rich uh, oxide content in the sands, and depending on the degree of oxidation, you're going to get the different colors. Uh, but it's also, you know, as you, as you look closely at it, uh, you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of shadows. Well, uh, you know, my daughters, uh, on different I have two daughters, they're both commented on, the, you know, just pulled over by this beauty. Uh, but I remind them that uh, uh, to get to get these images, uh, you're getting it either at first light or last light. And if you want first light, you know, you're getting up in the dark, you're driving in the dark, you're hiking in the dark, so you can get there for sunrise. So, you know, it doesn't come without, <laughs> it doesn't come without ever. I would think that if you went there at high noon, uh, you may see the same shapes. I don't think you'll get the characteristic beauty. But I'm just right at this point, I'm just going to go through a few just, uh, just to give you a sense of what's there. Um, not trying to pressure with any photos. You're going to see better ones, I'm sure, elsewhere as well. But uh, characteristically, this is what that, these are probably, you know, is, is, is fo most photographed areas of sub-Saharan Africa that one's going to come across. Trying to create a little abstraction here. This this particular scenes here in Singapore were done at just before the sunset hour. That's important. Keep in mind, I'm going to talk about something in a moment. And uh, as barren and dry as it is, you know, there's always room for life. And uh, came across this flowering plant. So beauty, beauty can be everywhere, and in the least ways imaginable. Okay, we have another scene here. Now, <laughs> this uh, dot here, that's not a dot on your lens, uh, on my lens rather, or on your computer. It's, it's actually a person. <laughs> in fact, it's the, uh, it's the leader of our, quote, elite group of photographers. It's, uh, Michael Melford has been shooting uh, for National Geographic for decades. Those of you that live in the area here uh, may even know him because he lives in the greater Mystic area. But uh, his, uh, his forte for many years with National Geographic has been that he would go off into the most remote parts of the, of the world and on his own. That, that was kind of his thing. And he'd come back, you know, his assignments, he'd come back with remarkable imagery and stories that that was doing his, his assignment for National Geographic. Well, in this case, his assignment was to try and show a very small group of us how to take pictures. Now, how he proposed to do that from this far away is, is beyond me. But I should point out, as I, I think I just did, we're nearing sunset hour. Now, over in those regions, as some of you that have traveled know, once the sun sets, we don't have a lot of light. So we've got to get back off the dunes get back off to our, to our vehicles and get out of there. So I thought about this for a while. What, what, was, what was going on? Did I, was I gonna criticize him for being, but no, I just, 
But what I realized, and it took, I guess, two years to realize, this photographer was rather pressing because what he was doing, he wasn't teaching us how to take better pictures. He was showing us proper social distancing. So thank you, Michael. This, this image here I'm showing, if you look at the, uh, this crest here, right along here, uh, when I was walking, walking from there, I looked down, I looked down, I had a magnifying glass, I was looking at the grains of sand, and I was a little puzzled, so I took a sample back with me. And I'm gonna just show you, this is just kind of curiosity thing, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Uh, first off, this is, a, this is a sample of, this is a, a photo micrograph of sand, actually taken from here in Dubois Beach, actually. Uh, another one, I think this was taken from uh, East Beach and Watch Hill. But if you look at the two of them, uh, which, which should be obvious to you is you have a mul multitude of sizes and a multitude of shapes. Now let's contrast that with what I saw, what I took. Here we go. Okay, these are, this is from the, from the Namibian desert, which I just saw, you just saw where I took it. This I just sieved out the coarser sizes. Okay, so when you look at these two, uh, one thing should be, uh, well, two things, but one thing's obvious is that the, the shape, they're very rounded off, no, no angularity, but that's to be expected. You've got, you know, tremendously high and consistent winds in that area, and that's what happens. But why, why two size? Look at the particle size. They're quite uniform in that, care, in that size range, as are the larger ones. I went back, I have three or four pages here of, what do they call it, geological, morphological, some fancy term like that, went back into the academic papers. And I tell you, I, I cannot give an answer as to why you would have two sizes so dramatically different on the same dune. But anyway, that's maybe near here and there. I just found that fascinating. Okay, this picture here, this is, this, uh, you know, it's sunset in the eastern sky. Uh, I just like the pastel colors, the dead acacia tree. and uh, I just thought it made for a nice scene, so nothing more I can tell you about this one. We're continuing the next morning. Well, yeah, next first one, we're going to see. We're going up on a couple of hot air balloons, and I think what you're going to get here is the, uh, the characteristics of, of really just how desolate and inhospitable this region of the country, or most of the country, really is. It's obviously at sunrise when you're going to have the minimum winds, as those of you that have hot air balloon would know. There's a balloon up beside that talking sign here, but I don't know if that's going to get rid of that. And now we're coming in. Uh, these were getting at first light and sunrise. And this is a different section, but uh, what you're going to see are the, uh, the, the uh, dedication trees. The foregrounds, the foregrounds are going to have the, uh, the silvery sand, the salt, the pans, like the clay and salt, they use the term pans. And we're going to see a lot of that because, in fact, a good part of the, uh, the Kosha National Park is a huge pan, which would represent, uh, you know, uh, beds from ancient, uh, ancient rivers or lakes at the time, I should say. So I'm just gonna, let's, you can see the, I think this one is where the moon is setting, just behind the tree. Nice lighting, again, right at first light. Silhouette of a dedication tree against a very, very steep dune. Again, we've got a, we've got a little smudge on the, got a little smudge on the, over here. Well, it's not a smudge, actually what it is is a oryx. Norix is uh, one of the two, two or three antelopes that survive well in the, the driest of the climates. It's actually a favorite prey of the desert lions. We didn't see any desert lions, but this would be an area where, where the oryx would be certainly looking for, uh, looking to avoid such a, an, account, an encounter. And again, let's just, just take a 10 to 15 seconds. These are just some images that were taken Again, right after sunset, showing the different forms, different layers that, that were there. 
I took it. I don't do much photoshopping, but I, the next two, I just decided to take some images and do some black and white. I thought just, I guess, for artistic purposes, if you want to call it that. But anyway, that's what we got here. Here's where the moon is setting over one of the We got some very clear, obviously very clear skies too. So that certainly is a help in any of the photographs that you've seen or will be seen. Okay, now we are, uh, we're gonna be flying to another section of the coast, which is aptly referred to as the skeleton coast. And you'll see why as we're flying over. These are the interior regions, just you know, just the, inside the coast. There's a you see like a dry, uh, a dry river bed running running through here, right along here. Another you look at another dry river bed right through this lower area here. volcano and you can see some of the uh, waterways alongside it but this is this is really no man's land and finally we get to the coastal area very rocky rock strewn um, reef strewn area of the coast strong currents always high winds and usually perennial thick fog. So uh, we were very fortunate that we were able to fly here at that particular time because normally it's just fog bound and, and you just have no visibility. But this is certainly, uh, if it's known uh, as the graveyard of ships, uh, you can see why. As a matter of fact, uh, along that whole coast, you know, there's been hundreds, hundreds of ships that have met the demise there. And yet there's only maybe one or two where you can see remnants of it. So it shows you that this area, shore area, does a good job of, of let's say, burying its, burying its uh, victims. And um, now keep in mind, you're on, a, you're on a ship and, okay, the ship gets wrecked or whatever, uh, but you survive it, I can get to shore. Well, uh, you just saw what, what the interior is like. So obviously the chances of surviving a shipwreck in that area are, are nil to none. So from here, from here we're going to another extremely desolate but enticing area of the country called Kaoka Land. Now Kaoka Land is few people. There's a, the indigenous, uh, the, there's Himba people, which we'll see in a bit. This I think is probably a, a dead um, baobab tree. Not sure, but it has the characteristics of it. And this would be a, I call it a lodge, a basically a, where we would have cabins where we would have stayed, uh, we would have stayed for our, uh, our, our, our visit there. And this area is known, well, it's not wildlife rich, but I, I have to point out, I have to take a couple of minutes to point out, you know, if you're going, if you want to, uh, want to see a variety and quantity of wildlife, you're not going to see it in this region. Uh, and that's just fine with me because I have a, you know, when you go to these other game parks and you see something interesting, all of a sudden you got half a dozen or a dozen vans around and people clicking away their cameras. Uh, you're not going to get that here because in Kyoko Land, there's actually really not a lot of roads. And uh, you don't know what you're going to see. You basically go looking for it. And uh, the, these are the desert elephants. They've adapted to the desert climate. And what's different about them from some of the other areas, even in, in Namibia, is because there's not a lot of visitation, uh, they're, they've got a reputation of being aggressive. And uh, it's, it's very important, probably even <laughs> life-saving, to make sure that whoever you have as a guide or driver is well, uh, has, has knowledge on the, on the wildlife, especially, particularly the elephants. Nothing else is going to threaten you in advance. 
that the elephants can and will. So that, uh, that to me, that has a great personal appeal because now we're, there's nobody else around. We're seeing that on He's following us and we're following them, whoever it may be. And I, I, just, I just really enjoy that part of it. Couple moving along the way. Uh, unusual to see two, the double tusk on that. When you get up into the Yukosha area, they do a lot of grinding away on the, on the salt pans and, and the tusks don't get to be very large or back off and they're lost. Uh, and the giraffes, you've seen plenty of giraffes, but I'm showing you two images here just to share something with you. You can see this giraffe, that's an acacia bush there. These two, it's behind them is the acacia bush or you know, the acacia trees. And the other reason I'm taking a minute on this, I'm, of all the wildlife adaptations I've seen in the wild, the one that somehow sticks with me the most is the ability of a giraffe's tongue to move in and about. You know, those thorns are hey, two, three inches thick and they're absolute needle sharp, very hard. I did a walking safari some years ago in Kenya had sandals on and there's one went completely through the uh, sole of the sandal into my foot. That's how sharp they are. So how they're able to get their tongues in between those thorns and pull out the leaves, uh, to me it's just an, it's an amazing adapt, adapt, adaptation of that uh, species. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got some baboons just playing around here. Again, you're not, you're not seeing wildlife rich areas, you're looking you're looking to see what's there. And then you've got it all yourself. Now, in that same area, this is home to the, uh, one of the indigenous ethnic groups called the Himba tribe, Himba. These are indigenous people. Uh, and there's, there's thousands of them that live in that, in this particular region. And they're, you know, they're semi-nomadic. And just, I don't want to, this is a whole subject for another talk, but the, the tragic history of the country that uh, goes back to the late, late 1800s uh, when the Ger Germany ruled uh, in a Southwest Africa. And for the next 30 years or so, up until uh, 1915 or so, they came in at the time, they stole from the India, the cattle, the land, the women. And at one point there, I think it was like maybe 19, early 1900s, 1904, the, uh, the Himber uh, rebelled against them and they ended up killing off uh, a number of Germans. Well, all that did was serve, there's a new German governor coming in and he used that as his excuse to attempt uh, a almost totally successful extermination of the Himba people, tens of thousands. They went from something like 40% of the population to today, I think maybe, I don't know, 5%, something like that. I don't know the exact numbers. And, but it was a brutal extermination. Uh, the severity of the beheadings and all that were, were just, was a, just a terrible part. In fact, uh, I think it can probably be uh, said that this represented the, uh, the first genocide of, uh, of the 20th century. We're there later in the day. I'm just gonna show you a couple of photos going through the tribe. And they're out in the desert, you know, their water, the water that they get is probably about a half a mile walk across uh, the CV area just a little bit later in the pictures. Now, just take a couple of minutes here to talk about something that's very, <laughs> very dear to me for a variety of ways. And I could go on for an hour on this, but I'm not. You'll notice she's holding a photo. It's a photo of herself. I took it with a Polaroid camera, small Polaroid camera that some years ago I bought. And I, this is my stock and trade whenever I'm meeting people in other regions, other cultures. And if you think about it, uh, when we as visitors to these places go today, in most cases we go along, we've got our cameras with us, we will go up, wherever it is, and they ask permission to take somebody's picture, we do that, we smile, we're grateful, we 
in the age of digital cameras, we turn that camera around, we show the whoever it is the picture. Oh, they smile, they like it. But at the end of the day, what have we done? We've taken something from them, right? We've taken a picture from them. I I looked at it quite the opposite. I want to give them something. I want to I want to relate. I want to I want to connect with them. The Polaroid camera is an invaluable tool because think about it, what you would do or what I've done, I'll take that camera and I would go up to somebody like this, not necessarily even ask them for permission, just point it and shoot it. And immediately I'm taking the camera towards them and half the time they think I'm giving them the camera. But you know, 10 seconds later, you're starting, they start to see this two by three inch image coming out and they see it's of them. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Then I can take some other pictures and do whatever I want. But at that point, I've made a connection. I mean, the world is my oyster in terms of being able to relate to this person. And again, I could I could tell you stories that just blow your mind. So I mentioned again, not because I'm showing off what I do, but I'm telling you as, as much as anything as a suggestion for those of you that if we, if and when we ever get to travel again, uh, to keep that in mind. Now here's a is a young gal. Uh, same thing with her. And she wanted me to take another picture like this, there, which I did. And then she 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 saw it. And then she actually asked me. She wanted to pose. She wanted to pose, and she asked if she could if I could give her a couple of pictures. So what she did, she posed like this. And if you look. If you look closely, you can see she's holding in her hand. This is a picture I had previously given her. And I think she wants it, you know, for her boyfriend or whatever, however they, I don't know if she had a husband yet at that point. She wanted basically as a model, you know, kind of a model, a picture of her. And it was just so satisfying to her. So obviously, and to me as well, of course, but you know, leaving something like that, you're leaving a mark. You're, you're really an ambassador. Uh, and I get, I don't mean that in an egotistical way. It's nothing special about me other than the fact that I, that I had a Polaroid camera with me. More scene here. I'll show you another one for a moment. And you know, what you're seeing, the, the coloration on her is a, is a pigment paint. It's called okra. And it's a mixture, as I understand, a mixture of red clay and butterfat. And it's applied uh, judiciously to their to their body, and uh, it serves a number of purposes, as I understand it. Uh, number one, it protects the skin from insects. You certainly, you know, you're not seeing in this picture, which is unusual. But uh, uh, anyway, it protects them from insects. It reduces the uh, transpiration of moisture from them because don't forget they're in a desert, and during the day it's pretty, it can be pretty hot there. At the same time, you know, it's a desert, as you know, a desert at night can get quite cold and you can see the sparse clothing on them. So it also acts as a uh, insulation, insulator against cold. And I guess finally among their culture, it's a, it's a desirable as a, uh, as a beauty enhancer. You can see that in this, in this picture here. I never know whether I'm going flipping through these pictures too quick or taking too long. I know what they are, so I hope, but I hope I'm not going too quick. Okay, now we're we're leaving. You know, their their village is just where I'm taking this. I'm taking this picture right from the uh, kind of the, the, the fencing, whatever you call it, right outside it. And uh, it's not sunset yet, but you know, again, the winds are blowing there continuously. Uh, you've got sand, uh, small grain, uh, uh, dirt there, and you're getting these dust storms all the time. And this, incidentally, this area through here, this is how far they would go. There's a riverbed there. That's how far they would go to get water. And that's, it's amazing. Okay, now we're off to, uh, we're off to uh, Itasha. Itasha is the uh, Namibia's premier wildlife destination. And it's huge. How huge? Well, the state of Connecticut, I think, is somewhere is over 5,000 square miles. And Etosha is almost 9,000 square miles. 
But you know, there are other, you know, through Africa, there are other large game parks. So that in itself may not be remarkable. But what I think that's remarkable about it is it is fully fenced. There's a fence that encircles the entire national park. And uh, part of it, what I'm showing you here, then maybe as much as one third of the park is this huge clay pan. Again, the remnants of a, a dry uh, uh, lake bed, salt, clay. And this is, this, and of course you can just imagine how uh, mirage rich it is. <laughs> Look around, you see mirages all over the place. But this is what about that silvery white sand, the whole area is dominated by it. But I'm looking at this, looking at this photo here, and it, re it reminds me, I have a, a sister who's a big supporter, big fan of uh, Mark Rothko and his, you know, his abstraction, his abstract art. Uh, very linear, so, well, I'm not that much of <laughs> knowledge on that, but if those of you that know his work, and I'm looking at this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna impress my sister and show her I can create my version of Mark Rothko. So I took that same image, image, played around with it to the extent you can see what I've done. And uh, I don't know if you've got a real vivid or <laughs> kind of imagination, maybe you could see that at some point that might be something that Mark Rothko would have, would have done. I don't know. I'll let my sister be the judge of that. Uh, just some scenes through here. These are uh, just some uh, wildlife captures that I thought that were interesting for one, one reason or another. Don't know whether they're squabbling or friendly. I don't know what that's all about, but I thought it was an interesting, interesting capture of the uh, trio there. Here, there. A cheetah, uh, I'll be looking for his dinner. And I guess we could say finding his dinner. We've got a few more quickly wrap it up here. These are uh, spring bucks. Spring bucks, uh, again, uh, along with the oryx, are those uh, that best survive the hottest, driest climates. One interesting thing I read, uh, of course, I'm not, I read that both the oryx and the spring buck, the kidney function is extremely efficient in the sense that in an effort to retain moisture for the animals, even the urine comes out in pellet form rather than a, a liquid stream. I also like this particular composition of these uh, antelope. Watering holes, there's, there's uh, many watering holes scattered throughout the park. Some are artesian wells, a lot of them are just, you know, most, as I said earlier, in the middle it depends on groundwater. So we have areas where the land itself dips below what the, the water table would be, uh, they have access to it. So here you've, you've got, uh, again, many of these throughout throughout the uh, park. Another watering hole, that's a hyena, in the for hyena in the foreground coming to, uh, to drink and get more of the giraffes. Uh, elephants, uh, now here, because this is, I should point out, uh, the Eclosia is a very driver friendly park. It's, you know, you can do your, get in your car and go, the roads are paved and it's a different experience than what I showed you earlier. So the, the, in the case of elephants are much more used to vehicles, although this one not happy to, not happy to see our vehicle and uh, expressing himself a little more uh, with the displeasure. But again, no further confrontation. This is a different elephant. This one, uh, uh, if you look at it, uh, two things may stand out. Well, number one, he's only got one tusk which I guess is not unusual the way they work them. But also, uh, if you look closely, what else is unusual about this animal, about this elephant? I don't know, does it have five legs? I'll let you 
me to decide, decide that one. Okay, enough of that. Uh, Secretary Byrd, comment to the area. Seen, I uh, love the composition of it. We're gonna see that bird in the next slide. I like the way the uh, giraffes were framed in the background. This is the, the country bird. This is the country bird of Natasha. The lilac breasted roller. I think it's actually the country bird of a couple other African countries. Here it is in flight. Beautiful bird. And uh, lastly, here I am in flight and flight home in which ends whatever I have to say. So that's it. Uh, unfortunately, I went a little more. It's almost an hour. So if there's no question, that's fine. If there are, I'll do my best to try and answer them. Thanks again for uh, spending uh, an hour of your time uh, visiting uh, Namibia.